Bonjour, bienvenue, merci d'être là à ce side event donc, qui, va, qui va donc être en français et en anglais. Euh, je suis Claire Tutenuy, déléguée générale de Entreprises pour l'environnement, le partenaire en France du World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Euh, et euh, nous organisons avec euh, ICTSD euh, ce side event dédié à comment le climat et le commerce international peuvent ensemble euh, prospérer. Et comment le, le climat, est-ce que le climat peut faire, est-ce que le commerce international peut contribuer dans quelle mesure à résoudre le problème climatique L'entreprise le, pour l'environnement a, avec de nombreux autres partenaires l'année dernière, organisé le Business and Climate Summit au mois de mai, qui a rassemblé de très nombreuses entreprises du monde entier et a, publi, a sorti un certain nombre de demandes et de messages, et notamment la demande d'avoir des prix du carbone des prix du carbone dans le monde de façon à stimuler les décisions favorables à la décarbonation avec une réserve et une question c'est que dans un certain nombre de secteurs quelques secteurs les, le, la montée nécessaire des prix du carbone peut entraîner des problèmes de compétition et de concurrence et des distorsions et des fuites de carbone et donc dans le travail qui permet mais de faire monter les prix du carbone, il nous paraît important de gérer, de traiter, d'apporter des solutions pour résoudre ce risque qui s'avère pour le moment être plutôt un obstacle à la montée des prix du carbone. D'où le fait de notre travail depuis lors sur ce sujet, avec en particulier une session qui a eu lieu au Business and Climate Summit à Londres ce mois de, au mois de juin dernier, euh, et un, un, une, nous essayons de faire en sorte que euh, ce sujet soit résolu relativement rapidement. Il est sur la table depuis bien longtemps. D'où cet, euh, cet événement qui rejoint euh, le, et construit et s'appuie sur le travail qu'a fait ICTSD sur le sujet. Et, et donc, c'est pour, ce, pour cela que nous avons organisé ce side event ensemble. Et nous avons le plaisir et l'honneur d'avoir Pierre-André de Chalandard, qui était président de PE l'année dernière au moment du Business and Climate Summit, qui en est aujourd'hui vice-président et qui est président directeur général du groupe Saint-Gobain, qui interviendra au nom de PE sur le sujet. Ingrid. Thank you, Claire. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for making it to this side event. I know that we're facing a fierce competition this morning. Uh, there is a session going on about the US election. So thank you very much for, for being here. Um, so uh, let me say a few words about who we are, ICTSD, um, the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. We are a think tank. Uh, we are based in Geneva. Uh, and we have been working with, the, with issues in the intersection between trade and climate change for many years. Um, I can say that when we, when we started doing it, it was considerably more difficult to have such a full room when we talked about trade issues in the climate context. So we can really see a, a, a positive development uh, here. So um, a few words about this project that Claire referred to. Uh, so over the past three years, we have been working on a, a big project uh, about the future of the global trade system together with the World Economic Forum. And it's called the E15. And under the E15, we've, um, uh, we've had a number of different expert groups diving into different uh, Uh, future challenges for the trade the trade system and one of the topics that we looked specifically at was um, climate change and we had another one on um, clean energy so the outcome of that project which which uh, gathered um, hundreds of of leading experts so it was very much an expert driven uh, project uh, was a number of policy options for the trade system to consider so not only the WTO but also uh, other uh, frameworks that are relevant in the trade context. Uh, and I actually see some of the experts who attended the climate group in the room. So that's, uh, that's, very, uh, that's very pleasant. Um, so we brought a few copies of the paper. It should be outside um, in the room. Uh, and our partner in organizing the discussions on climate change was uh, climate strategies. So we're very fortunate to have Haro van Asselt with us today, who is a member of climate strategies and, and one of the Uh, leading experts in, in writing the, the options. Uh, so we'll hear more from her in a minute. Um, Shall we start? Yes. yes. Okay, so let's move on to the, to the presentation. So um, let me introduce the speakers on my right side. So first we have Harro van Asselt, who is a, a professor and um, a fellow with, this, with the Stockholm Environment Institute, and as I mentioned, a member of um, 
the E15 initiative on climate and trade. Uh, to his right, on his right side is Mr. Uh, Ho Aik Ho Lim from uh, the WTO, where he's the director for trade and environment. Uh, and on his right side, uh, Peter Govinda Sami, who is a longtime friend of ICTSD and has the very interesting um, position of, of negotiating both climate change and trade. Um, and to the far left, we have Mr. Steve Sawyer, who is the, the chairman of the Global Wind Energy Association. Uh, and next to him, Monsieur Pierre-André de Chalandard, who has been briefly introduced by Claire already. So we have uh, both the clean energy industry and, and the energy um, intensive industry. So that's going to provide for an interesting <coughs> dialogue. So, uh, hello, please, the floor is yours. Right. Good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you, Ingrid, and thanks also to ICTSD and Entreprise pour l'Environnement for asking me to, to join this very distinguished panel on what I think is still a very timely topic. We know that we need all hands on deck in the fight against climate change, and this talk is basically to make a very simple point, and that is that trade agreements can play their part too. But before I go into that, let me start uh, sketching a quick picture of the state of international trade and climate policy after Paris and after Nairobi. So both agreements that were re reached last year in December. So last year was, was a significant moment in the development of, in of international regimes for both climate change and trade. And just a few weeks after climate negotiators reached the Paris Agreement, um, a universal new agreement uh, with, with a significant flexibility in the implementation of parties Trade negotiators also reached a deal at the 10th WTO Ministerial Conference in Nairobi. However, importantly, they also agreed to disagree on the future of the Doha round of trade talks. Partly related to that, the WTO has been increasingly flanked by a number of, of regional trade agreements, a more limited number of plurilateral trade agreements, as well as several so-called mega-regional agreements, such as uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, and the EU-Canada Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA. What the future holds for these agreements, however, is, remains to be seen. While we now know that CETA has just been signed just a few weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal reported only yesterday that the Obama administration would not try to pass the TPP anymore. So likewise, the prospects for TTIP look quite grim, at least from the US perspective. So having sketched this context, what does the Paris Agreement actually say about trade? Well, nothing really. It, the, agreement, the agreement contains no trade measures, uh, such as those used in, in other treaties, such as the Montreal Protocol. And unlike the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, it also does not contain any explicit provision setting out the relationship between climate and the trading system. However, Article 3.5 of the UNFCCC, which calls for coherence between the climate and trade regimes, still applies. So there is still a, a general indication of how the relationship between the two regimes should be. Although the Paris Agreement is silent about trade, though, it might, may still have trade implications. First, achieving the goals, if we actually are serious about achieving all our, our NDCs and to stay well below 2 degrees uh, C, it will very likely create a significant international market for climate-friendly goods and services. Second, measures adopted as part of, uh, part of a party's NDC may actually affect trade. Uh, for example, 108 countries have mentioned uh, renewable energy in their in NDCs. And to the extent that they support such measures through su subsidies or other support measures, there may be implications from the perspective of international trade law. The third, and related to that, increasing ambition, and particularly if this happens at different speeds for different parties, may increase pressure for, uh, on governments to adopt measures to level the playing field and to tackle carbon leakage, as was already referred to by Claire. Although border carbon adjustments are not foreseen in the near future, they may return again once ambition starts to be ramped up. And pressure for them may also go up if one of the biggest emitters doesn't participate, a scenario that unfortunately became much more likely this week. And finally, and perhaps a bit more speculatively, the emergence of, of coalitions of countries working together through the cooperative mechanisms of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement may lead to trade implications if such coalitions restrict the inflow of emission reduction units from parties or non-parties. So in short, the Paris Agreement does not have, uh, doesn't say anything directly about trade, but it may have indirect trade implications. But what about the effects of trade agreements on the climate? Well, if you read the news and, 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 and some of the literature, some will say that these effects are negative. News headlines point to the fact that the WTO dispute settlement body is striking down renewable energy subsidies in Ontario and India. 
civil society expresses their express their concerns and their fears about the negative effects of the climate um, of the provisions on, on climate change on um, on regulatory cooperation and investor state dispute settlement in in the mega regional agreements and they also complain about the lack of transparency in these trade negotiations academics for long have pointed out that international trade law may, may uh, exert some kind of uh, chill effect or potential chill effect that may uh, stifle the adoption of new climate policies in countries well, we, we should take these concerns seriously in the, in, the, in the negotiation and the implementation of trade agreements. My point is that trade agreements can also be an important lever in achieving climate change objectives. So trade agreements can first of all help, help diversify their economies by making other goods and services available to them. But they can also help in facilitating, facilitating trade in climate friendly goods and services and by lowering tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. However, at present, I think much of this potential still remains unrealized. So what can be done about this? And here I want to refer to two projects that I've been involved in. And one of them, uh, Ingrid already mentioned just now, which is the E15 expert group on measures to address climate change in the trade system, which was convened by the ICTSD in the World Economic Forum in, over, over the last two years. And the second is an ongoing research project that I'm doing together with, with Climate Strategies. And reports for both of them uh, are available online. If you want to come and see me after this, I can, I can point you to them. I don't have time to list or discuss all the options, but I do want to mention a few of the options for moving forward here. First, I think we can, can aim to clarify the general relationship between WTO rules and climate measures. And one argument in favor of reforming WTO rules is that the case-by-case -case nature of WTO disputes does not offer sufficient structural guidance for the implementation of NDCs under the Paris Agreement. And it also leaves the settlement of climate-related disputes to a body that is guided first and foremost by the rules of the multilateral trading system. However, doing so is easier said than done. Importantly, it's very hard to determine what the actual contents of any change of rules should be. I think we need to be very careful, for, for instance, in suggesting that WTO members should categorically permit climate measures. As a broad definition might also include protectionist measures that ultimately might do more harm than good for the climate. Conversely, if we only uh, permit a very narrow group of measures, we may be excluding genuinely effective climate policies. But even if we know what changes we want to make, uh, changing WTO rules it can be challenging. Amendments have hardly been used in the WTO context and negotiating them will be very hard. Instead, what we, we, we suggest in, in our report for climate strategies is a much more straightforward approach for WTO members to simply declare that achieving climate objectives is considered to be a legitimate reason to depart from trade rules, provided, of course, that governments follow the, follow the norm, normal uh, trade rules um, and, and basically under the exceptions of, of the, the general agreements of ter on tariffs and trade. This doesn't have to be controversial, as it is already in line with some of the rulings of the WTO dispute settlement me mechanism. However, and this I think is the main point, it offers a very important signal that WTO rules are not there to stifle parties' climate ambitions. And that signal, I think, needs to be given. Then a second option would be to expand ongoing negotiations on environmental goods to a wider set of climate-friendly goods and services, and also possibly to cover technical regulations and standards. So at the moment, discussions are ongoing on an environmental goods agreement involving some of the world's largest trading nations, and these may be concluded in only a few weeks' time. This could be an important step forward in reducing tariffs for some climate-friendly products, as the benefits of the agreement are also extended to all WTO members. Of course, we first need to see if, the, if these negotiations can be successfully concluded, but if it does, it could offer hope for further measures and further negotiations. Then, as a third option, bilateral trade, agree trade agreements offer an important vehicle for the development of trade rules that promote climate objectives. And one key example in this regard, which Mr. Govinda Sami can probably tell you much more about, is the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, which contains several provisions relevant for climate protection, including provisions on fossil fuel subsidies. Moreover, as is increasingly commonplace, bilateral trade agreements offer another platform for climate cooperation on issues ranging from, uh, from forests to carbon markets to adaptation. And last but not least, I think one of the biggest challenges in discussing climate and trade is a lack of information about, about the potential impacts of trade-related climate policies. Countries may be, sometimes rightfully, concerned that trade-related climate measures adopted by countries are protectionist measures in disguise. However, rather than dragging each other to court or to the dispute settlement body of the WTO over climate policies, Governments should try and seek to use be better the, the mechanisms that are and the forums that already exist under the WTO and under the UN climate regime to strengthen the transparency of tri trade related climate uh, measures and their potential impacts. 
So this includes under the WTO, for, for instance, the, the Committee on Trade and Environment, the Committee on Subsidies and Countervailing Measures, and the Trade Policy Review Mechanism. And under the UNFCCC, it includes the forum or the improved forum on response measures, which is actually still ongoing and, and trying to establish this work program for the next few years. Although these forums have been already been used to discuss climate and trade interactions, it's a I should be fine, thanks. Uh, one important task for discussions could be to clarify what the trade impacts, if any, are of climate measures that are contemplated by parties, based on improved notifications and reporting by parties. This would ideally allow for a more expert-based assessment of measures, hopefully helping to depoliticize what is often still so a uh, very sensitive issue. So to sum up, I think the trade agreements at the very least should not be a barrier for, for a strong climate action, but I also believe that they have a positive role to play in helping to achieve the Paris Agreement's goals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold, with this uh, very quick presentation of uh, sophisticated and complex problems. Uh, and I will now hand over to Pierre-André de Chalandard. Merci. Oui, donc je, je, merci beaucoup. Donc je, je m'exprime euh, ici en, au nom de, de EPE, donc un, 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 un think tank français des, des, des grandes entreprises sur, ces, sur les sujets de, de, de développement durable et également en tant que, que président de, de Saint-Gobain. Quand on avait organisé, comme Claire l'a indiqué, il y, a, il y a un peu plus d'un an, la préparation de la COP21, le premier Business Climate Summit, il y avait deux messages qui me paraissaient très importants. Le premier, c'est que le monde des entreprises s'est mobilisé sur ces sujets et que les entreprises sont à la fois le problème et à la fois la solution et que on aura besoin de, de l'implication des entreprises si on veut progresser sur ces sujets du, euh, du changement climatique, mais que les entreprises ne peuvent pas le faire tout seules et elles ont appelé à, à ce son copu, son, qu'on s'occupe sérieusement d'un sujet majeur qui est de donner un prix au carbone. Les entreprises, euh, elles ont besoin d'un signal prix pour orienter leurs investissements dans un sens ou dans un autre. Et euh, comme, elles, comme le, le monde des entreprises est convaincu qu'on va aller dans cette direction d'une manière ou d'une autre, et que si on veut être cohérent avec les objectifs de l'accord de Paris, il faudrait arriver assez rapidement d'ici 2020 à un prix de l'ordre de... 30 dollars euh, euh, la tonne équivalent de, de CO2 et, et de 100 dollars euh, vers 2030 si on veut éradiquer le charbon et si on veut massivement euh, transformer toute une série euh, d'industries. Comme les entreprises sont convaincues que ça va se passer progressivement, beaucoup d'entreprises ont mis en place depuis quelques années des prix internes du carbone, pour, euh, même s'ils ne l'auraient pas imposé, pour simuler ce que ça donne et orienter le, leurs investissements. Ce que nous avons fait chez Saint-Gobain, et Saint-Gobain est un, un très bon exemple de, de à la fois en problème et solution. Saint-Gobain est un des, une, des entre, enfin, une des grandes entreprises dans le monde, je crois, compte tenu de ce qu'on fait, qui a l'impact le plus positif à travers tout ce que nous, toutes les solutions que nous apportons sur l'efficacité énergétique dans le bâtiment, qui est un secteur majeur d'émissions de CO2. Mais pour faire avoir ces solutions, nous sommes aussi un émetteur de CO2 à travers les produits que nous fabriquons. Pour faire un double vitrage, on a besoin de CO2. Donc, on a besoin d'une de, de, orientation euh, euh, prix dans ce, dans ce domaine. Et pour, pour, pour orienter notre, notre politique, on, va prendre, on, prend des, on fait comme si ça allait arriver. Alors, il y a un certain nombre de pays dans le monde, de régions, qui ont mis en place des instruments qui concernent, euh, pour orienter ce, ce prix du carbone, mais ce qu'on constate, et même si ces, ces accords, euh, où soit avec des mécanismes de marché, soit avec des taxes, en fait, de facto, ils excluent toute une série de secteurs industriels qui sont relativement émetteurs, et pour lesquels il y a, euh, en fait, aujourd'hui, euh, des produits qui voyagent à travers le monde, et où donc une décision prise dans une zone a des impacts ailleurs. Donc, il n'y a pas de, de pays aujourd'hui qui se bon, euh, décidé de mettre un prix du carbone élevé qui pourra conduire à ce que les industries disparaissent, si euh, dans le même temps, ces industries ne vont pas, puisqu'on en a besoin, aller dans, un, dans une zone où il n'y aurait pas ce prix du carbone. C'est le phénomène de la, des fuites de carbone euh, bien, bien, bien connues. Alors, il y a une solution qui est souvent euh, euh, étudiée, qui consisterait, pour ces pays qui veulent euh, être vertueux, à dire, pour gar garder l'industrie dont on a besoin, il faudrait que ce soit 
euh, euh, armes égales et donc de mettre une, soit sous forme de taxe, soit sous forme d'une autre forme aux frontières par rapport à cette zone. Mais là, en pratique, ça n'a pas été mis en place parce que, telles que sont faites les règles de, de l'Organisation mondiale du commerce, euh, il y aurait euh, immédiatement des procédures incertaines et longues qui se mettraient en place. Et donc, en pratique, euh, tout ça n'a pas euh, eu lieu. Donc, on, a, on voit bien qu'il y a une contradiction qui, euh, qui existe entre le euh, sujet euh, de, du commerce euh, euh, mondial et le sujet euh, du climat pour toute une série de secteurs industriels. Donc, comment est-ce qu'on peut essayer de progresser dans cette direction Alors, d'abord, je voudrais saluer le, le très, très important et bon rapport qui a été fait par le, le, le Centre international de, du commerce et de, de développement durable en liaison avec le, le World Economic Forum au mois de janvier, donc, qui, je crois, montre toute une série d'initiatives et de politique qui pourrait être mise en place. Mais si on veut progresser, je pense qu'il faut que ces propositions soient aient un, un endossement politique. Et aujourd'hui, de façon pragmatique, je pense qu'il si, faut qu'il y ait une, une gouvernance mondiale. Parce que c'est avec le système de l'accord de Paris, et ça fait son succès, mais c'est aussi ses limites qui est basé sur des contributions volontaires, s'il n'y a pas de gouvernance mondiale sur une série de secteurs, ça ne marchera pas. Et je prendrai un exemple par... Euh, qui montre que ça peut marcher, qui je crois est quelque chose de très important qui a été fait cette année, qui est l'accord international sur euh, l'aviation euh, civile, où il se trouve que là, il y a une organisation qui a un rôle hein, de gouvernance mondiale fort, et donc en liaison avec les compagnies aériennes, il y a un accord très important qui a été conclu, qui est un accord qui a engagé les entreprises, et donc les compagnies aériennes, qui, se, qui du coup s'engage à ce que d'ici 2020, leur croissance soit neutre en carbone et qu'elle réduise à peu près de, de moitié d'ici 2050 avec un mécanisme de, 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 de marché hein, pour, pour, de, de compensation, hein, un mécanisme de prix qui s'assurera avec des sanctions que cet accord euh, entre en vigueur. Donc on voit bien à la fois que c'est possible, mais qu'il faut une gouvernance mondiale et le, 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 le transport maritime est en train d'essayer de faire la même chose. À l'inverse, on voit qu'il y a des industries qui s'étaient essayées de s'organiser, le ciment en est un des, un des exemples, mais que comme il n'y a pas de, de gouvernance mondiale, en pratique, ça, ça n'avance pas. Et donc je pense que si on veut progresser de façon pratique, il faudrait que, si on est pratique, que ce soit le, le G20, qui me paraît l'instance aujourd'hui, de, de, pas de gouvernance, mais qui peut peser et influencer sur la gouvernance mondiale, se, se, se saisissent de ce sujet et sur la base de ce rapport, euh, décident euh, ou fassent travailler pour arriver à décider quelles sont les options qui sont euh, euh, recommandées. Donc, euh, je crois que dans, dans, compte tenu de la logique de l'accord de Paris, il faut aller sur… On, il n'est pas réaliste d'avoir un prix… Euh, euh, c'est ce, qu ce que les entreprises souhaiteraient, un prix mondial unique du carbone, c'est ce que les économistes disent qu'il faudrait faire, un, un prix mondial unique du carbone euh, rapidement, il va peut-être y avoir des, des clusters de groupes de pays qui vont se rapprocher, mais je pense que si on veut vraiment progresser, il faut aller vers une gouvernance mondiale qui pourrait être par secteur, hein, mais qui serait en, en gros bénie par des organisations qui auraient un, un certain pouvoir et qui trouveraient, permettraient de résoudre les contradictions qui existe, comme l'a indiqué le précédent intervenant, entre le sujet du climat et les, et les sujets du, euh, du, euh, du commerce. Et donc, moi, je, je, je souhaite, et l'EPE va, euh, va proposer euh, euh, à tous ceux qui le souhaitent, d'appeler de, de, le G20 à se saisir euh, de ce sujet. Merci beaucoup, Pierre-André. Effectivement, il y a un draft call for action euh, qui euh, commence à être travaillé et qui vous a été circulé ou vous sera circulé à la, à la sortie de la session. Merci beaucoup, Pierre-André. Ingrid, euh, voilà, je pense qu'on va maintenant donner la parole à Steve Sawyer, pardon, président de la Wind Association, Donc, sur une the industrie nor très the différente qui est le Green, uh, green Growth <laughs> Industries. Yeah, I'm neither the president nor the chairman, merely the secretary general. But anyway, um, we uh, have come a very long way since uh, we in the wind industry, since this uh, discussion about climate change started. And in 2015, I'm happy to report for the first time ever, uh, the additional electricity generation in the world, Uh, the largest single contributor to that was wind energy, more than coal, more than gas, more than any other technology. Um, also, just to frame the discussion a little bit, is that since 2010, 
the majority of new installations in the wind energy sector have been outside the OECD. So it's a little bit different than some of the other technologies. And it, it speaks to the competitiveness and the, uh, the, uh, the growth of the industry driven to some extent by emissions issues, but more by cost and speed of deployment. And it, particularly in some of the large emerging economies now, uh, the immediate problem of dealing with uh, urban air pollution, which is making a number of large megacities, particularly in Asia, uninhabitable. Um, but we have a, 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 a conflicting mandate um, from the various people to whom we seek, uh, from whom we seek uh, policy direction. One is to generate the largest number of carbon-free electrons at the lowest possible price. And I think we've done pretty well here in Morocco. Just last uh, spring, we had a, a long-term PPAs for 850 megawatts uh, of wind at less than three US cents per kilowatt hour uh, for 20 years. Um, and there are other examples in, in Asia and, and Latin America and in Africa. On the other hand, um, which is a demand which is made of the climate regime as a whole, we are entrusted with creating jobs, creating new industries, lifting people out of poverty, solving energy inequality, solving all sorts of inequality issues, which is a bit much for the wind industry itself to handle. It's not really what we're set up to do, but we cope as best we can. Uh, trade policy is relevant in the sense that um, for us in particular, the biggest difficulty that we have to deal with is um, when countries begin establish a renewable energy program where they want to uh, set up local content requirements in order to qualify for uh, whatever, um, as was struck down by the WTO in the situation in Ontario. Uh, the Indian case was a little bit different. Um, the reality in the marketplace is everybody does it in one way or another. Some are more clever than others. Uh, the Chinese put in a local content requirement for two years. Uh, by the time the US had actually brought it to the WTO before it was heard, they abandoned it, but it had already achieved their objective, which was to transform the industry from one which was largely owned by foreigners into one which was dominated more than 90% by Chinese companies. Um, we have a particular situation in Brazil where now for the first time, I was the lonely voice arguing with my Brazilian colleagues against their onerous local content requirements, uh, which were attached not directly to the policy that was uh, procuring wind power, but to the only available financing which was through the BNDS, the Brazilian National Development Bank, um, had onerous and quite frankly ridiculous local content requirements in order to qualify for that financing. Um, as a result of which I think 11 OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, either turbine manufacturers, blade manufacturers or whatever, set up plants in Brazil. Now they are hoist on their own petard in the sense that the government has changed their BNDS is withdrawing from financing wind projects. All these companies have this plant in Brazil. And of course, because it has been constrained by local content, it's not remotely competitive. So it's cheaper for a turbine manufacturer to import from China or even from Europe with the, for the burgeoning market in Argentina than it is to drive it across the border. Price, precisely because of the local content requirement, which I won't go into the details, but for one thing, you have to buy large quantities of Brazilian steel Brazilian steel is a social welfare project, as it is in many countries. Uh, hence, the, the, uh, it's not even remotely competitive. Um, these dynamics play out differently in every country. I mean, Denmark, you know, is an OECD member, WTO member, all the rest of this stuff. You will not find a turbine spinning in Denmark that was not manufactured in Denmark. They're a bit more clever about it than some of the others. Similar situation in Spain for many years. South Africa has actually done it a bit more sensibly in that their requirements are much more, uh, rather than focusing on hardware, focusing on patterns of investments, ownership, and uh, investment in education and training in particular. They have other problems in South Africa at the moment, but I would suggest that that's one. But not to go into all of these details, but you can see the, the, the things that we are caught between because all of these measures raise costs and the local government or the bank or whoever will always argue that local content will uh, decrease the costs, but the reality is in almost every case, unless you're talking about a market the size of China, it increases the costs. Um, 
the good thing from our side is that what we can say to governments, and which is true and which is demonstrably true, is that if you create a stable, solid market uh, with a clear visibility for three, four, or five years, you will get local content because it will make because of the size of the equipment uh, transport um, from the other side of the world is quite expensive, um, and obviously building things, especially for the offshore sector where you have these enormous, enormous machines now. Um, building it as close to the site of deployment is, is an absolute imperative when the economics make that even remotely possible. Um, and the, the other thing which my brethren from the solar industry, manufacturing was a significant part of the investment costs in solar 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. It's becoming a much, much smaller now one now and most of the added value uh, in the solar industry is actually downstream from manufacturing and that is by definition local. So our message to governments is if they want to see this happen then forget the local content requirements, focus on clarity on the market size policies and the industry through the market will optimize itself as much as possible. Transport, <clears throat> yeah, we can transport turbines from China to Argentina cheaper than you can in Brazil now because of the dramatic overcapacity in the shipping industry, shipping is ridiculously cheap. Air freight, relatively speaking, is ridiculously cheap. Air and uh, maritime emissions are the ones that have been exempt from this process, exempt from emission control reductions um, since the early fights back in, back in Kyoto or even before. Someday, somebody's going to get a handle on them, and pardon my skepticism, but ICAO and IMO have been promising the moon for 20 years have delivered absolutely nothing yet except for this latest breakthrough in ICAO, which I hope will yield something eventually, although pardon me if I'm a little bit skeptical about it. Um, that could change the picture dramatically uh, if both uh, overcome the dramatic oversupply on both the air and particularly maritime transport and, price, and, and there's a carbon price attached to the emissions, then prices could go up and that could change the trade picture pretty dramatically. But uh, I'll just wrap it up there uh, to say that actually trade policy is important to us, but I think much more important in the, in the clean energy transition is the issue of subsidies, uh, where depending on whose metric you use, if you use the IEA metric, we're talking $550 billion a year in direct subsidies to fossil fuel production and consumption. If you use the IMF metric, it's more like $6 trillion. Um, somewhere in between the truth lies, um, depending on what you're trying to measure. And uh, I think that would do more to advance the, removing those subsidies or rationalizing them in some way would do more to speed up the uh, renewable energy transition than, than trade policy issues, although trade issues in individual markets, particularly in developing ones, are critical. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, I think we really heard um, a, a good um, or two good presentations highlighting the different trade challenges that the different uh, industries are, are facing. Uh, and I think many of them actually relate back to, to what we heard from Harrow in his introductory uh, presentation. So uh, let's move now to um, Ho Lim. You have a lot to, to, <laughs> to think about, I think, after this presentation. Yes. Uh... Thank you very much, Ingrid, and thank you very much, Claire, for the invitation to join you on this panel. Um, yes, indeed, a, a lot to think about. And I, and I think maybe a, a good starting point, if I can, is to broaden the discussion a bit and, and to say that really here we're talking about, um, in my view, linking together the climate change measures and climate change goals into an into a broader sustainable development strategy. In, in fact, bringing these two parts closer together, uh, if they're not already very close, because uh, that seemed to be the theme that I heard in several sessions which I attended yesterday um, from Patricia Espinoza, the UNFCCC Executive Director, um, about the success would depend on how we bring this integration together into a broad sustainable development strategy, uh, one that successfully brings together climate, social inclusion and sustained economic growth. So I think through that lens, one can, can perhaps see a little bit better uh, what would be the trade contribution 
to sustainable transition to a low uh, greenhouse gas economy, a climate neutral economy, and also more competitive economies. And there, there are two, two basic channels. I mean, there could be more, but I know I, I will just keep to myself to, to these two. Uh, one is about reducing costs and deploying key cl climate technologies quickly and, and to where they will have the biggest impact. I think we already heard from the panel uh, some of the concerns with costs and how trade or trade barriers could add to these costs. So that's one clear channel. How do we reduce costs and deploy? A second one, which is related, is about stimulating investment. And here we're talking about transformational change, and that seems to be what I've been hearing a lot. Uh, you need investment, and you need to stimulate that investment in energy, infrastructure, transport, uh, information technology, and many other key sectors. Um, and here again, trade has uh, an important relationship to investment in terms of stimulating that investment. Now, looking at these two channels, there, there are some ongoing work already at the WTO, which picks this up. Uh, Professor Van Elsight um, has already referred to one, which is current negotiations by a group of WTO members on an, on an environmental goods agreement. Um, these negotiations have, a, have one objective currently, which is to eliminate tariffs on a range of environmental goods. Uh, and these will include those needed for clean and renewable energy. Uh, and the aim, they're currently still working quite hard at it, is to try to deliver something uh, by December. So uh, a lot of attention here uh, in Geneva on how do we get there. Now, apart from a work that is directly uh, linked to environmental goods dissemination, I, I think it's also important to recognize that there's some other trade policy areas that could make a big contribution. Um, last year in, in Nairobi, the ministerial conference that was referred to, uh, WTO members agreed to abolish uh, agricultural export subsidies. And agricultural export subsidies, they are mentioned as a crucial target of sustainable development goals on zero hunger. And so in a sense, WTO members have already delivered on that particular target for sustainable development goals towards uh, zero hunger. And why do is this linkage possible? Because export subsidies essentially reduce uh, efficient farming practices. They, they lead to overproduction. Uh, they encourage more, and thereby by eliminating them, you can encourage more sustainable agriculture. And it can also help governments redirect their efforts, uh, reallocate uh, resources uh, in, in a more efficient way. So that's, a, again, one example. This is specific to agriculture, of course, but it shows a, a potential big impact that could be made for other areas. And then you have broadly um, other types of agreements that have taken place on information technology, for instance. Again, the information technology agreement is not directed at climate or environment as such, but the benefits of IT, uh, and if you can make that uh, benefit through stimulating investment, reducing costs, will have an impact. Many of the examples spoken of, of uh, smart cities, smart grids, uh, different ways of monitoring uh, emissions, etc., rely on the digital economy. So again, if you do something here for the digital economy through trade policy, through trade negotiations, you will make a, an impact. Now, that being said, designing coherent policy uh, is not easy, but I think it is doable. And, and what we do need to move towards is to create a virtuous circle of trade and environmental policies which promote sustainable production and consumption, growth and development. And because it's difficult and because it's challenging, um, there are, I think, very base, basic <coughs> things we need to do. And one is to have greater dialogue, cooperation, uh, and that dialogue and cooperation should be first to foster greater transparency and objective understanding of the links between trade, climate change, and sustainable development. Uh, secondly, based on that knowledge uh, and dialogue, help identify, resolve problems before they become uh, really entrenched. And, and finally, you know, and if after careful discussion um, 
and examination, we do find, and here I say we, but really it's the governments, uh, do find that specific challenges cannot be resolved uh, with existing tools, then there, there is a question here to be answered. You know, uh, do the governments, do they have the political uh, willingness to engage and find appropriate multilateral solutions? Um, that being said, you know, I, I would hasten to rush too quickly to say that existing tools don't work. Um, I think we do have the tools and we can make them work better, but the tools are there. Um, at the WTO, for instance, um, already I think mentioned as well, uh, we have the Committee on Trade and Environment. It's a forum that has been created since 1995, um, dedicated precisely to this task of um, understanding the links between trade and environment and also shedding light on what might be good practices and also providing the means for governments to actually discuss and debate issues that they might find uh, more sensitive or more difficult. Uh, at the UNFCCC, you, you have the decision from Paris to address the potential impact of uh, response measures. Um, and I think these two uh, forums can be very important and there's a significant potential for discussions in both the WTO and UNFCCC forums to complement and cross-fertilize each other. And, and this would have uh, important benefits in, in trying to work towards greater coherence between trade, climate action and sustainable development. Now, of course, you know, that, that sounds all very good, you know, but I'm sure we all in the room know that this is not going to be easy. I mean, uh, we live in an environment which, if I can say again, broadening the discussion, um, where multilateralism is being challenged, whether you're talking about multilateralism in, on trade or multilateralism on climate change or on SDGs, uh, that fundamental principle today is not perhaps as strong um, for all as, as we previously believed. And so it's also important to recall some fundamental principles that uh, I already heard mentioned about, you know, uh, some dispute cases and how WTO rulings uh, address certain issues. Here, here, I think it's, it's, it's um, you know, it, it is the case that, you know, international trade rules do give room and they do give significant room to pursue environmental and other policy goals. Uh, that's done through a general exception, but I, I won't go through that because it's not the purpose of this particular panel. But at the same time, there is a balance here and that balance is that, you know, the actual environmental policy must respect some conditions to avoid protection, protectionism. And one of this is basically being non-discrimination. And, and that particular principle is not you know, unique to WTO, is actually there in the UF, UNFCCC convention itself, which is that, you know, measures taken to combat climate change, including unilateral ones, should not constitute a means of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination or disguised restriction on trade. So it's not as if the two regimes are speaking uh, across or at odds with each other. It, it is very much, as what I understand, you know, a central principle as well, in the climate change regime. Um, and I think what we want to do uh, is to move more towards looking at, you know, how do we enhance on the positive role that trade can bring? Um, I've only mentioned one aspect, which is environmental goods agreement. Um, that agreement, if it's successful, may well extend itself into other areas uh, that depends on the, the parties to the agreement, uh, as well as attract other members to join in. Currently, it's about over 40 over WTO members who are a party to that agreement. Uh, they include very large economies and very small economies. Uh, and if that can enlarge, it would be an important um, contribution. And, and very much uh, on the issues that had been raised on carbon border tax adjustment, on carbon pricing, etc. You know, that debate, you know, is really one that's really for the members of WTO to think about and to see what they would, how would they would uh, address this. Uh, for me, I just want to just mention one sort of statistic that I, I was given by one of my colleagues uh, very recently, is that even if we look at that type of measure, uh, and here if you're looking at it through a pure trade lens, 
it's a measure that can only be applied to exports, okay? Um, it, it would not be addressing the totality of the production which may not be exported. And if you look at one figure, um, which I have here, is that, say, Chinese exports on aluminium, steel, and paper to the US in 2014 accounted for only 0.406 of total production of these particular goods. Uh, similarly, Chinese exports of cement to the US was only even lower, 0.044% of all cement produced in China in 2014. So what you would be targeting is a very, very small part of you know, the, the goods that would be ending up in the export market if you were to go down this particular route. But you know, I, I throw that just for, for the mix, just for discussion and for thinking. Uh, it doesn't really mean that I have a, an answer to this or whether this is actually even a, a correct view. Uh, one can clearly quibble about my figures or maybe there are other more relevant figures. Uh, but I think my main point to finish is that um, there is a political interface to this, uh, there is a legal interface, and you cannot ignore the political interface because this is particularly important. And I don't think anyone today wants to go down the route of um, using trade measures that could potentially spark retaliation rather than cooperation on addressing climate change. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aik. We have then heard the uh, uh, industry point of view. We have heard the limits of what uh, 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 multilateral organizations can do, and it is now up to government representatives to, 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 to speak. Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting. meeting. Uh, obviously, I can't speak for all governments. Uh, I can speak uh, on behalf of uh, from Singapore's perspective, as many of you know, uh, Singapore is a small island city state, the size of Lake Geneva, with very limited renewable energy options. So we import uh, all our needs, whether food, energy, uh, everything. So trade is very critical for us. So therefore, uh, the rule of law in international trade is critical for Singapore. And as a small country, uh, the rule of law in international politics is also equally important. So multilateralism, multilateral processes like the WTO and the UN and the climate change uh, Paris Agreement are all critical for Singapore given the smallness of Singapore. Having said that, uh, let me just try, before I go into my points, just try to speak to the title. Uh, can international trades help save the climate? Well, I would actually situate this title in the context of sustainable development because we can't look at trade and climate change or environmental protection in isolation, it has to be situated in sustainable development. So once we have situated it in sustainable development, we can have an answer. And that answer is not from me, but that answer was given by parties to the United Nations at the Rio Plus 20 summit, where the UN affirmed trade's role as an enabler for sustainable development. So in short, trade can help save the climate. But obviously there are many uh, issues which our previous speakers uh, highlighted. So having said that context, let me now give my perspective uh, coming from a small island city state uh, and also uh, dealing with both the WTO negotiations and the climate negotiations. Let me just give first give uh, five uh, reflection points looking back uh, from a trade climate negotiators reflections of the Paris uh, process and the Paris Agreement. First, uh, in our view, uh, yes, the Paris Agreement was a good outcome. It's the first comprehensive climate uh, agreement encompassing comp contributions from all countries. This is important for the environmental integrity of meeting the climate challenge. My second reflection point, the Paris Agreement is a boost for multilateralism. This is significant as the risk of unilateral actions would be high without a robust multilateral system. Again, this is from the perspective of a small island city-state. Third, Paris demonstrated that multilateral environmental agreements based on international consensus is the best way uh, to, to coordinate policy action to tackle global issues like climate change. Fourth, the Paris Agreement, all of us must uh, bear in mind, is founded on national circumstances. As uh, the former executive director of the UNFCCC uh, put it very nicely, the strength of Paris is that it builds a broad highway and allows countries to choose their lane of choice. If there's one reason why Paris succeeded, perhaps this could be one of the main reasons. So the Paris Agreement is founded on national circumstances. And as we implement the Paris Agreement, 
national circumstances has to play a part. By final reflection point, the Paris Agreement reinforced the Convention's requirement on parties to cooperate to promote a supportive and open international economic system. This in recognition that such a system, or an open system, would lead to sustainable economic growth and development in all parties. In other words, uh, protectionism is not the answer, poverty is not the answer, but open trade and development is the answer to the climate problem. So having uh, look, look, looked back, let me now look forward. So we need to forge coherence between the trade and climate regimes. And some of my uh, colleagues here uh, earlier highlighted the, the interface between the trade and climate regime. Uh, first, uh, point three statements of fact. First, the Paris Agreement recognizes that parties may not only be affected by climate change, but also the impacts of measures taken in response to it. And one cluster of measures, which uh, the other speakers alluded to, are trade measures, carbon tax, border tax adjustments, uh, carbon labeling, and so forth. Uh, there was a UN FCCC paper prepared just before Copenhagen, which highlighted that trade measures are, are most likely to impact developing countries. And depending on how these trade measures are implemented, designed, and applied, they can be incompatible with WTO law. So that's a statement of fact. Trade measures, uh, depending on how they are uh, applied, could impact on the development uh, aspirations of developing countries. So that leads to my second point. The interlinkages between response measures, trade response measures, and WTO law will become more pronounced as parties implement their pre-2020 actions and post-2020 nationally determined contributions. The, state, the third statement of fact is response measures are not only developed by parties. Uh, as some of us may know, uh, we need to be cognizant that response measures are also being developed in international organizations. Uh, one example is the carbon footprint standards being developed at the ISO. And these standards uh, probably will have a significant, significant impact on countries uh, which need to uh, depend uh, more on uh, fossil fuels uh, at least in the immediate period, given their lack of uh, natural uh, geographical endowments. So given the interface and the likely potential for conflict, uh, what should be done? As uh, in fact, the IPCC uh, assessment report five highlighted the need for preemptive cooperation. So I want to underline the word preemptive cooperation. So there need to be a preemptive cooperation between the trade and climate regime. So we shouldn't wait for disputes to take place. There need to be preemptive cooperation. So what is needed for this preemptive cooperation? Well, in our views, uh, preemptive cooperation has to take place at three levels. First, at the national level, between economic, environment, and energy ministries. Second level, at the multilateral level, uh, at, organize, at organizations dealing with response measures such, <laughs> such as the WTO's uh, Committee on Trade and Environment, the UNFCCC's forum, uh, and, of, and of course, at the ISO itself, given that the carbon footprint standards is developing, will have impact on uh, trade. And at the third level, there should be cooperation between the international organizations. So first, at the national level, second, at the international organizations themselves, and third, between the international organizations. This preemptive cooperation, in our view, must be guided by some agreed parameters. Uh, in other words, we need a governance framework for response measures. So for the sake of respecting the time that is given to me, I won't go into all the potential uh, uh, governance uh, framework, but let me just highlight uh, two points. First, uh, when we look at governing response measures, as I highlighted earlier, it is important to take into account the national circumstances of countries. In particular, countries listed in Article 4.8, 4.9, and 4.10 of the Convention, which includes uh, LDCs, alternative energy disadvantaged countries and small island developing countries, among others. Second, recognizing the right of parties to establish their national policies in accordance with their respective national circumstances. I have a full list, but I'm just reading a couple of them. Uh, but as, as countries implement the response, response measures, it is also important to respect the competences of the various uh, competencies and the mandates of the respective organizations. And another point, transparency of response measures is a key aspect of preemptive cooperation. Transparency entails first ex ante notification and then ex post assessment. So these are some uh, governance uh, framework points. But let me now just uh, conclude, and later on I'll be happy to uh, uh, respond to any questions you may have. I just have uh, three points as yeah, my concluding uh, remarks. 
First, uh, as I highlighted at the beginning, we need to situate trade response measures in sustainable development. The Paris Agreement mandates that climate protection should be enhanced in the context of sustainable de development. To quote the WTO's appellate body, uh, measures to respond to climate change must be colored, textured, and shaded in sustainable development. In this regard, it, is, it was a good outcome that parties have agreed uh, yesterday at the response measures uh, track uh, for the first meeting of the ad hoc technical experts group, which is in fact going, the first issue they're going to look at is the issue of response measures in sustainable development. That's a great start. My second concluding point, uh, we, as, which I also highlighted at the beginning, is the, the recognition that trade is an enabler to sustainable development. Hence the importance of keeping markets open the su successful outcome of the EJ negotiations will be great, but it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. As many of us know, goods cannot walk. You need services. So complementing the EJ uh, environmental goods agreement, there need to be a complementary agreement on uh, energy services and uh, environmental services. My last point, a strong multilateral trading system uh, embodied in the WTO is the best safeguard so there is a possibility when countries implement measures to meet their climate targets, there's a possibility uh, of the notion of disguise uh, protectionism. A strong uh, WTO system is, the, is important to guard against uh, uh, climate protectionism. But if I get, sorry, I got one last point. It's, a, it's not a point, but it's a quotation uh, from uh, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, which I thought, which he made at the G20 in Hangzhou uh, a couple of months ago. This is what he said. Green mountains and clear water are as good as mountains of gold and silver. To protect the environment is to protect productivity and to improve the environment is to boost productivity. So the essence of what he's saying of the close relationship between economics, economy, trade, and, uh, and climate protection. Thanks. Merci beaucoup, Peter. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Peter, pour cette, cette intervention qui, qui renforce le, qui est le besoin de gouvernance sur ce sujet. Euh, on va ouvrir la parole aux questions dans la salle, mais Pierre-André de Chalandard avait un petit commentaire sur l'intervention de Haïk Houlem. Oui, je, je, je m'excuse, Monsieur Lim, mais je ne peux pas complètement être d'accord avec vous sur ce que vous avez dit sur l'industrie, que le l'organisation du commerce est capable de régler tous ces problèmes et vous avez expliqué qu'il y avait des, des produits en prenant le ciment qui est effectivement un produit qui ne voyage pas très très loin qu'il y avait des, des exportations faibles la, 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 ce, que, ce que je veux dire c'est qu'aujourd'hui dans la majorité des industries qui sont fortement émettrices de CO2 en pratique il n'y a pas une seule région dans le monde qui a mis en place un prix du carbone qui pourrait aller à les faire progresser. Et la raison pour laquelle ça n'est pas fait, il y a toujours des mécanismes d'exclusion, et la raison pour laquelle ça n'est pas fait, c'est à cause de ces fuites de carbone. Et donc, je pense que, euh, la, la, vous, quand vous avez dit qu'il n'y a pas de sujet et l'OMC est capable de les, de les régler, je ne suis pas tout à fait euh, euh, d'accord avec vous. Si vous prenez le cas de l'acier, c'est encore plus important. L'acier, d'ailleurs, euh, qui est un, un, une industrie qui est extrêmement nocive en termes de CO2, mais dont vous avez besoin pour faire, des, comme vous l'avez dit, comme M. Sayal a dit, dont on a aussi besoin pour faire de, des, des, des éoliennes. Donc, le sujet n'est pas, est, est, est pas, est pas, est pas aussi simple de mon point de vue. Merci beaucoup. Je pense qu'on va prendre les questions de la salle, à moins que Haïk veuille répondre non. So, any, any questions in the room? Um, we'll try to, to collect two or three questions before returning to the panel. Um, so, Peter, well, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, Peter Wood is. Stand up, maybe. Uh, Peter Wood is with IASD based in Geneva. I'm very interested in both the climate change and trade agendas, and thank you very much for your uh, excellent interventions. A uh, very simple question we've got, we hear a lot in this um, the conference about there's a carbon bubble that, that must not be exceeded if we're not to go beyond two degrees C and it's a very small bubble. And for that, we clearly need to do a lot of common things in a lot of countries. That's to decarbonize the electricity sector in particular, um, to, to work out how to go forward best with the energy intensive industries, to decarbonize transport and so on. Um, 
you know, to what extent do we have to positively now discriminate for renewable energy and potentially positively discriminate against fossil fuel energy, including fossil fuel energy investments? I'm just wondering how that might fit into um, the trade and climate change um, agendas that you have in mind. Thank you, Peter. That's an excellent question. Uh, okay. I think we can collect a few. Yeah. If there are any more questions, let's see. Are there any more questions at this point? Uh, no? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, in a perfect world, no, no such discrimination would be necessary. Um, but we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, as has been demonstrated uh, in no uncertain terms <laughs> this week. The, um, I would just point to the issue, two, two things. One is the issue that I pointed into my intervention about the fact that while governments are coming here and talking about climate finance and all the rest of it, what they're actually doing is spending many, at the very least, many hundreds of billions of dollars at home subsidizing fossil fuel production and consumption, mostly consumption, but the production is still quite substantial, particularly in the OECD countries. Um, you can't have it both ways. The other thing that uh, the consequences of the Paris Agreement, as I can, have been continually pointing out to governments for the last 10 months or so, which generally makes them rather uncomfortable, is that any analysis of uh, the physics of the atmosphere will tell you that if the sine qua non for having the slightest chance of meeting a two degree target, never mind a 1.5 degree target, is a completely decarbonized power sector by 2050. And if you want to talk about 1.5, then it's well before 2050. Translating that into the reality means that any decision that you make to build a coal fired power station or, for that matter, a gas plant today means one of two things. Either you are knowingly invested in an asset which will become stranded prior to the end of its economic life, or you don't believe what we agreed to in Paris last year. And that's not a political argument, that's physics. So unless you're gonna build your coal-fired power station or your gas plant with an economic lifetime of less than 30 years, which is never done, um, then you have to come up and face that reality. And that doesn't apply only to OECD countries or only to Annex One countries. That applies to all countries. And I was at, made this point very strongly to a bunch of Caribbean governments a few months ago and they say, but, 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 I said, there's no buts. The, the physics of the atmosphere does not allow for buts. Um, so I, how do we get there? Um, short of, of, of placing very high prices on not Following the, the physic, physical imperative, I don't know. I, to me, for the last 25 years, putting a very large, very strong price on carbon across the board globally has been the only way that I could see that we would actually, short of a complete set of regulations on every aspect of the economy, which would be anathema to most people for many good reasons, is the only logical way that I can see of doing it. Politics is not logic, I agree. So, but here we are, but we have to just keep repeating to these governments that you cannot build any new fossil fuel power stations anymore. Now, if you believe what you said in Paris, and that's, there's no discussion about that from a physics point of view. Doesn't mean they're gonna go along with that, but it means that if we are going to actually meet the targets that were agreed in Paris last year, then we're gonna have to do something about all these stranded assets in 10, 15, 20 years time. Oui, moi, oui je, je suis d'accord avec tout ce que vous avez. Je voudrais faire juste un petit, un petit bémol, si vous me permettez, c'est que je pense que dans le, à court terme, relativement court terme, euh, il faut quand même faire une grosse différence entre les différentes énergies fossiles. Donc, je ne suis pas sûr que je suis complètement... Et quand on voit le problème majeur aujourd'hui, c'est le charbon. Et donc, substituer du charbon au gaz à court terme, si on arrive à avoir la rentabilité euh, de, du gaz dans les avant qu'on soit sur le plan renou renouvelable, comme on en sûr, ce n'est pas forcément euh, dans une optique de court terme, nécessairement, euh, même si je suis d'accord avec vous à long terme, nécessairement complètement euh, euh, irréaliste. 
Parce que la, le, à très court terme, le fait de passer du charbon au gaz, c'est quand même, en termes de réduction des émissions de CO2, c'est quand même probablement, euh, quand le renouvelable, on ne peut pas faire que du renouvelable à court terme non plus, hein, euh, euh, et, euh, puisque pour des questions d'intermittence, on va trouver la solution, mais on ne l'a pas complètement partout. Et donc, euh, passer du charbon au gaz pour ces sujets-là, dans la période de transition qu'on va vivre dans les 20 ans qui viennent, je pense que, alors est-ce qu'on a la rentabilité de le faire, je ne sais pas, je voudrais apporter un tout petit bémol, euh, je pense que ce serait déjà très, très, une très bonne contribution. Il y a une question, il y a une question pardon, euh, alors you wanted to respond. Um, just to, to, to add to, to the previous speakers, so basically the question is, should the UNFCCC or the WTO have a role to play in, in fossil fuel subsidies or addressing fossil fuel subsidies? Uh, or are they well placed to do that? And and in a way, you would think, look, given the mandates of both both um, both regimes, you would say yes. Um, at the same time, of course, uh, adding these issues to already overburdened negotiation agendas and already very sensitive uh, ne negotiation agendas, you can see how it's more becoming more difficult. At the same time, not talking about it at all, and this is, I think, what's happening largely in the negotiation halls. Um, to me, does not make sense. And if, if we can talk about renewable energy subsidies, um, we should at least also be able to talk about fossil fuel subsidies, um, not necessarily to develop rules immediately, but at least talk about their, their potential implications uh, for the climate. Um, so, and, and as, as you well know uh, yourself, Peter, and what others uh, also called for here, I think the first step towards that, as I was already saying, is about transparency. It's about actually knowing what's happening, uh, notifying, so improved notification under the WTO, but also Having, having countries inform uh, what, what is happening in terms of fossil fuel subsidies under the UNFCCC. Um, and of course, we need to take into account that a lot of activities in this regard are already happening outside of these forums under the G20 um, with, through, through the work of the OECD. Um, but again, just sticking the he our heads in the sand in, in these forums, I think, is not a very sensible way forward. Whether that can lead to rule development in, 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 the, in the longer term, that's another question. But I think as a first step, transparency will be key. So if I can, if I can just uh, <clears throat> a comment on uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Singapore imports uh, all of all uh, fossil fuel for our energy needs. About ninety over ninety five percent of our energy mix is actually natural gas, uh, because you do not, as I mentioned, we do not have renewable energy options given the dense population and the smallness of Singapore. Uh, so energy efficiency is the core uh, mitigation strategy. Uh, but since we import all our fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel needs, uh, our policy is not to subsidize fossil fuel uh, because we want to let the market set the price, uh, setting prices right, so that forces uh, consumers to conserve. So that is the policy. But although that is Singapore's policy not to subsidize, but as uh, if I can put on my head as a, uh, someone uh, from the G77, uh, I would also like to highlight that countries in other development situation may need to subsidize given, poor pe given the poor people they have. So it, it, I, I don't think we can uh, make a blanket statement that one children, I'm not advocating subsidization, but we need to see the context. Uh, so, so even if uh, sub subsidies need to be uh, uh, Taken away, there need to be a, a phase out and taking into account the considerations of the needs of the poor in the countries for so that they have sufficient access to energy services. Merci, Peter. C'est effectivement euh, le, la différence qui a été faite entre les subventions à la consommation et les subventions à la production qui est importante. Euh, Aïk. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt the flow of uh, going to the questions. Um, no, no, just to mention so that it's clear that. You know, what, what I was basically saying was that, you know, WTO agreements already do contain space there for uh, general exceptions on environmental nature. Uh, and these exceptions can be used. Uh, that, that was one point. And then the other one on more specifically on carbon pricing, the WTO rules say nothing about carbon pricing. Um, they do not say that they are illegal, do not say that they cannot be used. It's completely silent. Uh, the only point is that general WTO rules are about non-discrimination. So the question is, how do you bring about non-discrimination? Uh, 
uh, that that was basically it, you know. And the third point, which is a very very small um, just point, was simply to say that if you're thinking of anything that you use at the border, then the significance of that instrument, be it whatever the the objective is, could only change behavior if exports is a very big part of of that industry. That that was all. So there was the only three points really. Thank you. Merci, Eric. Il y a une question euh, dans le fond. Euh, il y a un micro qui peut, on peut vous de, peut passer un micro. Voilà, vous allez, allez-y. Hello, my name is Tobias Nielsen from Lund University. I have a question on consumption-based accounting. Is this a, a critical component of this discussion or is it an, an unnecessary burden for some countries? Uh, sorry, we did not catch the beginning of your question. Uh, consumption-based accounting. So looking at carbon embodied in trade and getting a better understanding of this. Um, is this a critical component or you would say an un unnecessary uh, burden to some of the um, some countries in their indices? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there are any more questions from the floor. Yes, there is one, two more questions. Uh, can we please pass the microphone? Yes. Hello, my name is Pia Carazzo from the University for Peace. My question is more out of lack of knowledge. If we were to abolish all fossil fuel subsidies, would the price of renewable energy automatically trump uh, fossil fuel energy without doing anything else? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think there was another question on that. Yes, right here. So. Uh, Milan Alcabat from SEPS in Brussels. Uh, I want to latch on to the point of any measures on the border and that it only makes sense insofar as uh, export our large share. Um, could it not be the case that the fact that there are yeah, some issues with competitiveness uh, impacts what you do on uh, inside in the non-traded aspect or share of production? and that uh, yeah, leveling the playing field could therefore um, lead to much more action on the non-traded part of production. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's one more question on that side of the room. I think after that, we may probably have to close. Miguel Narvaez, uh, Minister of Agriculture in, in Mexico. Do, do, uh, when you subsidize anything, in particular uh, fossil, uh, fossil, fossil fuel, you, you promote wasting the, the, the resources always. And I think it's better, don't you think that it's better to give a direct payment to the, to the poor? Because it's always this is the, the, the concern that, oh, the poor has to, I think it's better to give a, a transfer than, than, than to make a whole mess with all the markets. Don't you think so? Okay, thank you very much for these very, um, very good and relevant questions. I think we'll go back to the panel. Uh, there was one question on the price of electricity. Would you like to answer that one? I think in answer to your, yeah, I think in answer to your question, we're already there when it comes to electricity, not 100% of the world, but in sort of 90, 95% of the places. For instance, in South Africa now, which as you know, lies on a great pile of coal, the price for new build uh, wind and solar is uh, 60 and 40% cheaper than new build coal, respectively. Um, the latest rounds of, of tenders came in with wind at about 55 rand cents solar at about 65 rand cents and coal at 110. Um, and that's the direction that we're heading everywhere. The issue, of course, is um, the embedded generation, the large quantity of existing generation, where if you're comparing the cost of new build with something that was built 30 years ago and its loans were all paid off, then the cost of that is very low. Certainly that's the case with all the nuclear plants now. But with new build, we're already there. The consumption subsidies, on the other hand, are a different thing. And the more, far more difficult issue is uh, transport. Um, and again, electric cars are making 
and battery technologies and storage for using those are making extraordinary progress, but they represent a vanishingly small percentage of the market, although it's growing very quickly. So the removal of the subsidies would, would, um, would help enormously in terms of the rate of change, although I think the direction of travel now is pretty clear. Um, but it's a complicated subject and there are specific circumstances like Singapore where the issues are complicated by geographic or political factors where, you know, it, it gets more complicated. But for the major economies and certainly for the, for the uh, majority of the world's population, that would be the case already but accelerating it through reducing the subsidies and solving the transport. I mean, I, I talk mostly about electricity and I believe in a decarbonized world, we will use much more electricity for transport and for heat, but where, unless somebody, well, we do have an electric airplane, which just flew around the world with one passenger. Um, and it took about a year and a half. So we have a ways to go on that. Um, anyway, thanks. Um, let me try and address two questions. The first question uh, on consumption-based accounting. Um, I'm not an expert, to, uh, I have to say, but I do think that uh, consumption-based accounting systems will be very difficult given path dependencies, definitely at the international level under the UNFCCC, where the whole system is based on territorial-based accounting, uh, but also in, in, in regions like the EU, where, where, where it has been the same. Um, there's been, and maybe I can, can uh, uh, mention this also for Ingrid and, and climate strategies, there has been a large EU project on consumption-based accounting and including that uh, in emissions trading systems. So there's a lot of interesting research in this area happening about how that could benefit and how that could also address issues like carbon leakage. Um, to be honest, I think the, 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 the suggestions are, are on the table, um, but I think it will be very hard to change any existing um, systems, any existing accounting systems uh, very rapidly. Um, then also maybe briefly on the direct payment uh, to the poor. Um, I think in, in principle, this sounds like, a, like an excellent suggestion, but in practice, um, it may not always be easy. And, and one example that I know of uh, where they, they wanted to do that in India, uh, but what if people do not always have a bank account? Um, so basically the message that, that, that is there um, is that fossil fuel subsidies, the revenues that you save by phasing them out could be used for sustainable development goals. Uh, but it will depend on the country context uh, how to do that and and direct payments may work but may not always work in all countries more, more response to the questions or comments mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. we conclude so maybe we can ask peut-être nous allons demander à tous les intervenants de quelques mots de conclusion um, yeah maybe, maybe because the question was asked i didn't really want to come back the second time but uh, I mean, it, it was just basically a thought that, you know, if you, you're seeking to change behavior uh, by using a trade related measure, um, then that good has to be traded. I mean, if it's not traded very extensively, I can't do anything to put it on. Oh, is it on? Right, yeah. sorry. No, it's just a point that you, I think to the gentleman who was asking this question, uh, it was just a remark to say that if you want to use a trade related measure to change behavior, then that good has to be traded. If it's not traded to any great extent, what you do will not bring about huge change of behavior for the larger sector. So whether it could, one could be more specific at looking at other effects, possibly, but uh, my point was just a very simple one. Thank you. you will, maybe we have a few words of conclusion from uh, each of the speakers, unless there is a final question in the room. Peter? Uh, well, basically what I want to say is that uh, we have the Paris Agreement, which gives guidance on what needs to be done in the climate process in terms of climate protection. Uh, we have the WTO Agreement, which contains rules. Uh, obviously, the scope to improve uh, the WTO agreements, given the developments over the last uh, uh, 20 over years. So the challenge for us is how do we ensure that uh, we have coherence between trade objectives, which is an important objective, and climate objectives, which is also an important, equally important objectives. So that calls for preemptive cooperation. So there is a great, uh, there is certainly a role for the Committee on Trade Environment, the WTO, to play. 
also the forum on response measures at the UN FCCC and between them. I think that's uh, uh, that is one uh, immediate action that is needed. Merci. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I don't think I have so much more to add because I think Peter said it all. You know, I think that, that was really what I, I think would be important is to use both of the, the forums, get that dialogue going and have an open uh, discussion. I mean, I say open discussion, but uh, to the extent that governments feel able to have that discussion. You know, so I think that's the way forward. Thank you. I also don't have much to add. I just wanted to, to say that how I, I also find it important to have these events that we were having right now, but also that are coming right after this, uh, where we indeed have uh, people and representatives from different, different organizations coming together to discuss these issues rather than to discuss them in silos in, in, in Geneva and Bonn. Um, so I'm, I'm just happy that these types of dialogues are happening in the first place. Well, no, I... I want to, to, to come back on, pardon, je voudrais revenir sur mon, sur mon, sur, euh, mon message parce que je, je, je crois qu'il est important. Je pense que dans l'accord de Paris, qui est un, un progrès très important, les pays ont ce qu'il faut pour progresser sur euh, les, euh, les utilisations euh, diffuses de l'énergie, donc les émissions de gaz à effet de serre qui viennent dans le secteur diffus, dans les transports, dans les, les, les bâtiments, qui sont des secteurs très, très importants. Les, et les pays peuvent, sur une base volontaire, faire des choses euh, importantes. Et ce qu'ils font n'a pas, pas d'impact sur ce qui est fait par d'autres pays. C'est-à-dire que si on est plus ambitieux que d'autres pays, euh, on, euh, euh, on ne détériore pas sa situation en termes d'activité, de, 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 d'emploi. Au contraire, on peut l'améliorer. Donc, je suis très optimiste là-dessus. Je pense que sur le sujet des émissions industrielles, si on veut vraiment des changements de comportement, euh, il y a besoin euh, d'actions politiques qui, de mon point de vue, ne sont pas encore prises. Yeah, I'm, um, just want to pick up. I, I, I think the issue fundamentally is that you say equally important objectives in relation to climate and trade. Um, and we have another uh, sort of important objective, which is represented by the effect of the arguably the most powerful vested interest in the history of the world, with the possible exception of the Catholic Church, which is the fossil fuel industry. Um, and the way we speak in these meetings, they are arguably equally important objectives, but I think in the way governments behave and the way society behaves, we still hold the fossil fuel industry and its preservation and its whatever. We spend a lot more money on it than we do on, on the alternatives. And I have been arguing for about 28 years now that uh, the, uh, the objectives of this convention of keeping below two degrees or close to 1.5 or so ought, ought to be not equally important, the most important, the overriding objectives and the condition for the continuation of any of the others. And I think and until and unless governments not only say that in these meetings, but reflect it in their activities and the way they manage their economies, then we're going to be here at COP42 having the same discussions. If, assuming, we probably won't have it in Morocco because Morocco may be uninhabitable by 2040, by COP42. Um, we may be having it on the beach in Greenland, but... Um, Anyway, um, I think that, you know, we can talk all we want, follow the money, and the money has not yet changed course. It is changing course in the energy sector pretty rapidly, um, and I'm very encouraged by that, but we're not there yet. Merci beaucoup à tous pour ces, pour ces quelques mots. Euh, on vous a distribué donc un, un projet d'accord, un projet d'appel aux, aux membres du G20 pour travailler politiquement sur le sujet, puisque plusieurs des intervenants ont reconnu que le système actuel avait des limites et qu'il y avait un problème de gouvernance à, à, à traiter donc à ce niveau-là. Euh, il n'y en a peut-être pas assez pour tout le monde et donc euh, à défaut, donnez-nous votre carte de visite et vous serez donc associé dans cette conversation qui essaye de de monter euh, au niveau du G20. Okay, uh, I would also just like to make a few final remarks before we close. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our partner, the uh, Entreprise pour l'Environnement, and, and all the speakers. Um, I'd just like to highlight what I 
find us a few really real takeaways from this session. One is that we need to get the prices right. Uh, and that includes fossil fuel subsidies, but it also includes um, incentives uh, to the clean energy sector. Um, I think maybe I'm a bit more posi uh, positive than Monsieur de Chalandard when it comes to carbon pricing, because I see that there is quite, uh, actually quite a lot of progress being made. And I think that there are also um, op options for how the international um, society can collaborate around carbon pricing. I know that we are far from a global carbon price, but uh, what is an, an, um, an option, for instance, is to collaborate between different emissions trading schemes. And uh, if you're interested, we are hosting another side event on that topic uh, tonight. Uh, but I think that that's actually um, uh, a, an alternative to addressing some of the competitiveness concerns that the uh, energy intensive industry is facing. Uh, then I would also uh, like to emphasize what I see as an opportunity actually from this uh, session, and that's a stronger collaboration uh, between the different sectors of the industry, because you actually hold the solutions to each other's problems. <laughs> and I think that in the context where we are today, where international collaboration on climate issues is probably going to be more challenging than ever, uh, the industry has an important role to play. Uh, so I'd be really interested to see uh, what kind of uh, creative solutions that you could um, come up with. And then I'd like to just thank all the speakers because I think you've been very good at keeping uh, the focus on uh, the objective, which is sustainable development. And I thank you for bringing up the sustainable development goals because that's what we should really have in mind uh, in all our work going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup à tous. Is, uh, is, uh, your organization, not your company, your organization.